Let's just give the Lord a shout of praise. Come on, real loud, real loud. Keep going up, keep going up. We just, we're grateful for what the Lord, yeah, keep it there. Don't turn me down, keep it there. We are grateful for what the Lord is doing in this church. We are grateful for what the Lord is doing in America. How many of you know that we are experiencing right now in America an unprecedented outpouring of the Holy Spirit? That we are in a time where we, we cannot be casual about the presence of God. We cannot be casual about worship. We cannot be casual about prayer. We cannot be, can y'all hear me back there? Come I'm Hispanic, so if you're like, why is he shouting? When I got married, my wife is so white. Like when you ask her where what her ethnicity is, she just says California. She's she's that white. And her family would come over to our gatherings and they would leave and be scared. Like, why are you guys always fighting? We're like, we're not fighting, we're just talking. There's just passion. But you know what I realized as I've traveled to different churches? That the fire of God does not does not discriminate against what culture you're from, against what gender you are, male female, white, black, keep it real loud, Mexican, Hispanic, doesn't matter what culture, what race, when you get the fire of God, there is a passion that begins to happen in your life. When you get the fire of God, there is a hunger that begins to happen in your life. I believe this morning, we need to break out of this lethargy that we walked in with. We need to break out of this complacency. I don't know if you're afraid of the neighbor that's next to you, the person sitting by you, but we need to break out. We need passion back in the American church. We need fire back in the American church. We need the hunger of God. Come on, I can't hear myself. We need the hunger of God back in the American church. We are living in a time where the world is looking at the church and wondering, yeah, right there, keep it. Why is there more hunger and more passion and more excitement when we used to be at the bar, when we used to be at the club, when we used to be at the rave, then there is now that we've been born again. See, for years I couldn't praise. For years I couldn't worship. For years I couldn't shout. And I've made a decision now that I'm saved. I'm going to praise. I'm going to shout. And I'm going to worship every chance I get. It matters to God. Like, look at us in this room. We all want an encounter. We all want fire. We all want passion. And then I look at the people in the Bible that had passion, that had encounter, and that had fire, and they did something other people were not willing to do. 500 invited to the upper room. Only 120 said, we're going to show up. We are not going to stay home when the Lord is moving. We are not going to sit back when the Holy Spirit is moving in power. And they waited for 10 days. Guys, we can't wait for 10 minutes in the presence of God. I mean, we have so much TikTok brain that within 10 minutes, we're like, well, Lord, I mean, I gave you 10 minutes in prayer. I guess you haven't moved. I guess you haven't showed up. I'm going to just leave the place of prayer, leave the place of worship. We have such a low capacity for things that are spiritual, yet we can spend hours and hours easily watching Netflix, easily watching Facebook. The devil has rewired an entire generation's brain. They say now that the average American has an eight-second attention span, which if you didn't know, a goldfish has a 12-second attention span. And What's happening is our attention span is so low. Our hunger for God is so low. We have so many other options. This is why when you see God moving in Africa and in India and in Thailand and Indonesia, we think, well, I just wish the Lord would move in other countries, here the way he moves in other countries. The reason why the Lord is moving in an unprecedented way in other countries is because they don't have all the options. Their entertainment is miracles. Their entertainment is deliverance. Their entertainment is science and wonders. But in America, you have way too many options. Why would you choose God? So I could just watch my TikTok and watch my Instagram and watch my Facebook and watch my YouTube and my Disney Plus and my YouTube Premium and all these other things. And we give God our leftovers and we want an outpouring like the world's never seen before. But we want to give God scraps. We want to bring God leftovers. We want to give God the leftovers of our worship, the leftovers of our praise. And we sit back and even some of you, I don't know, it's like we're nervous to be undignified. We're nervous to be excited. We're nervous to shout. We're nervous to cry out. But if you read the scripture over and over again, you will see people, when they got the presence of God, they responded with passion. If you look at the book of Acts, they thought they were drunk. They said, are you guys drunk? Now the church, now when we get the Holy Ghost, people think we're boring. 
In the Bible, when they got the Holy Spirit, people thought they were drunk. You know why they said, why are you acting drunk? Because they were acting crazy. When you're drunk, you do things you would never otherwise do. And I know this because I used to be an alcoholic until the Lord saved me, healed me, and delivered me. And I used to do things I never would do otherwise. If I wasn't under the influence, I would have never said that to that person. If I was never under the influence, I would have never shouted at the uh, way I, I was so crazy. You would have dared me jump off the roof. If I was intoxicated, I would have done the craziest, stupidest things I would have never done otherwise. And see, what's happened in the church is when we don't have the Holy Spirit, we don't do things we would have never otherwise done. But when the Holy Ghost comes upon you, you become a different person. The old Isaiah would have never shouted in church. The old Isaiah would have never lifted his hands. The old Isaiah would have never been desperate. But when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you you shall receive power. Come on, help me preach in this Catholic church. You shall receive power and do what you never thought you'd do. I never thought I'd get up and preach to people, but then the Holy Ghost came upon me. We don't have the Holy Ghost coming on people any longer in the church. And so we don't have the passion and the boldness and the fire and the radical. And so we leave Sunday morning and we live just like the world. We act just like the world. And the world doesn't think we're drunk on the spirit. The world thinks we're bored on the spirit. But I came to tell somebody, I know some of you are new. You're like, well, at my church, we don't do all that. Praise the Lord. We're not at your church. We are in a place that believes in signs and wonders and miracles. We are at a place that believes in passion where the spirit of the Lord is. Come on help me there is liberty and there is freedom and you can praise like the chains have been broken come on a deliverance church ought to be the loudest church a deliverance church ought to be the most passionate church a deliverance church ought to be a church on fire like blind Bartimaeus shouting shouting shouting. And I know everybody doesn't like it. I know it's not everybody's flavor. I know it's not everybody's style, but this man didn't care about your style. This man didn't care about your flavor. This man didn't care about your preference. When you're blind and desperate, you don't care what other people think. This man said, I am going to shout not to get your attention, but to get God's attention. See, the Bible says Jesus was passing by and blind Bartimaeus said, I came here today. I'm so hungry, guys. I'm telling you right now, you might think because I'm a preacher or live streamer, I don't know what you think about me. Whatever you think about me, you might think I'm not hungry. I'm not desperate. I woke up this morning and the first thing I thought about was God. And I said, God, I need you. God, I can't live my life without you. God, I'm so desperate for your Holy Spirit. God, I don't know how to preach. I don't know how to worship. I don't know how to pray without you. God, I can't be a good father. See, we have to get to a place where we are so desperate for the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit that I say, God, I can't go to work without your spirit. Because if you can survive without him, you will. If you can survive, I'm going to tell you why a lot of us don't have the presence of God in our everyday lives. It's because we don't need the presence of God and we're fine without him. And we wouldn't even know if he showed up or didn't show up. We go weeks upon weeks upon weeks with no encounter, with no fire on the altar of our lives, with no prayer meetings, with no move of God. I'm not talking about the church. This church is obviously on fire. This church is incredible. If I lived in Washington, I would be at this church, obviously. I am not talking about in a building. I'm saying, when are we going to get to a place where we say, Lord, I I am so desperate for you. I am so hungry for your spirit. God, I do not care what anybody thinks about me. I do not care what my family thinks about me. I don't care what my wife thinks about me. I don't care what my husband thinks about me. I'm going to be like blind Bartimaeus and I'm going to cry out to you and I'm going to be desperate for you. I will not be denied. I need the presence and the power of the Holy Ghost in my life. I should have brought a second shirt, praise the Lord. Not okay. Guys, we're in a nation right now where, am I allowed to be down here, by the way, Vlad? I probably should have asked. Yeah, I'm good, okay. I just need to hear myself loud because my voice goes out. I, I'm at, we're at a place in America where business as usual, and guys, hear me because I have felt so much stuff going on in the spirit in the last few weeks. And you're like, well, is it because of the assassination attempt? No, that's just a sign that we're in the last days. That's a sign of a, a violent spirit manifesting in a young generation. I believe that there is a shift happening right now in America. I believe that we are headed into unprecedented times and that the Lord 
Lord is saying to us today that the days of playing casual Christianity are over. The days of you relying on this church to carry you are over. The days of you waiting on us to get up here and cheerlead for you are over. Why does it take 30 minutes for us to get you through worship, to get you into praise? You know what the Bible says? I enter his gates with thanksgiving, his courts with praise. I entered with it. I came with a praise. How would church look like if we didn't have to cheerlead and pump you up, but you said, I'm coming into the house of Lord, ready to worship and ready to praise. I've been on fire all week long. And now when I gather, we join our fire together. No, I'm not coming to church to get fire. I have fire. I live on fire every single day. I have so many testimonies. They're tired of me asking if I could share my testimony. You ought to be that person that Pastor Vlad's like, look, I know you're real excited. I know you're real passionate. But every, if I get a rag, that'd be awesome. Every single week you're wanting to testify. Every single week you're wanting to share. You ought to be that person that every single week you're the guy. Oh, that guy again is giving the testimony. Oh, that guy again is sharing his faith. Guys, when you get fire, you become unstoppable. People will tell you to relax. People will tell you to calm down. In fact, this was the prophet Jeremiah. Jeremiah, thank you, bro, lived in such a crazy day like we live in America. And Jeremiah said, I want to get up and preach something nice. And guys, I prayed to the Lord, God, would you just give me one nice sermon? Like, Vlad, I go through my sermons and I'm like, they're all radical. They're all judgment. They're all end of the world. They're all get right with God. I, I can't find anything nice. And there's people that's like, I brought my mom. And you know, she just, and I'm like, oh, great. I'm going to have to hammer. I mean, I'm hitting the sledgehammer every time. If you go watch my videos, you won't find one sermon where I'm, I'm preaching at church, where I'm preaching about the BMW gospel, where it's like God wants to take your three series to a five series. I mean, I want a nice, cute sermon. I wish I can get up here and just be calm and be like, today we're going to talk about the book of Galatians. I want to be that way. Way. And I try sometimes, and sometimes even in my notes, I'm like, man, I'm going to be real nice. They're going to like me. They're going to follow me. It's going to be great. But then every time I get up here, the Lord said, Isaiah, I did not call you to be nice. I did not call you. Maybe other preachers, that's great. Isaiah, I have called you to be an alarm clock in this generation. We are living in a sleeping generation. And I know some of you are annoyed by me. That's fine. An alarm clock is not made to entertain you. An alarm clock is not made to be nice to you. At six o'clock when my alarm went off and I snoozed it till seven. I wasn't happy. I was annoyed by it. It was loud. It was repetitive. It kept turning up louder and louder and louder. But you know what? The job was not to be nice and the job was not for me to like it. I'll listen to music if I want to be entertained. The job of the alarm clock was to wake me up and I came to blow the trumpet in Zion. I came to sound the alarm and call you to a fast and say, blow the trumpet the earth is shaking. The day of the Lord is approaching. We are living in the last days. Hallelujah. What does church, thank you, what does church look like in an hour of crisis? What does church look like when the nation falls apart, where we continue on business as usual? What Vlad is saying, we need more prayer. We need more fasting. We need more crying out. Guys, we need people that are so radical that we actually, this is, this is a crazy concept in the Bible, we actually look like we're from another planet. Do you know in the Bible they used to call them aliens? The world would literally call them aliens, pilgrims. That means people that were not from the earth, that were from another world. They would look at them and use the word Christian as a derogatory term. In the Bible, you did not tell people you were Christian. The world World saw you and they called you a Christian as a derogatory term because they said you so look like Christ you don't even need to tell me you're a Christian you don't even need to tell me you don't need 20 Bible verses on Facebook you don't need 20 Bible verses on Instagram your life outside the church because the world wasn't in the church spoiler alert outside the church your life is so different I don't know where you're from I don't know who you are that is why the kings and the rulers would see disciples stumble into their city these disciples were beat down and broken and hurting and they were weak, frail men. They were fasting. They were not these buff, tough guys that you think of. And the disciples would limp into a city and the king of the city would sit on the wall with all of his chariots and warriors and say, the men that are turning cities upside down have now entered our city because they understood that there was something changing, not in the natural realm, but in the 
the spiritual realm, we are changing something. See, today I'm preaching to powers and principalities that in the spiritual realm, something is shifting in your life. In the spiritual realm, amen, something is changing. So I sit in here and go, Lord, I need change in my life. God, I can't keep going on with this 30 minute a night prayer. I can't keep going on with giving you 10 minutes a day. See, the Christian life was never about praying a prayer and showing up on Sunday. In fact, you won't find either of those things in scripture just saying. The Christian life was about surrendering everything to a man, an actual real man, a man named Jesus, surrendering everything and saying, my life is no longer about my career, although I still have a career. My life is no longer about my family, although I still have a family. My life is no longer about what I can do, although I still do things. My life is 1,000% fully about serving this person, laying everything down. See, the Bible says the kingdom of God is like a man that finds a treasure in a field and goes with joy and sells everything he has to buy the field, uh, to buy the field to get the treasure. A lot of us say we have the treasure but haven't sold anything. Go, I have the treasure. I'm like, really? You have the treasure? What, what have you given up? What have you sold? See, when God calls us, he calls us to a life of surrender. That means this is what you do when you come to God. And again, I know some of you are like, well, I've never done that at all. Well, maybe you haven't found the treasure. And praise the Lord today, we can find the treasure, we can find the pearl, and we can become authentic, genuine Christians that the world are going to want to be like. They are not going to want to be like boring, stale, religious Christians. They are not going to be like want to be like Christians that complain, that argue, that bicker, that gossip, that have the same anger, the same depression, the same anxiety, the same addiction. The world is looking for people that are not like them. The world is looking for aliens, people that look different, that act different, that talk different, that sound different. The world is not looking for another definition of another religion. They're looking for a demonstration of Christianity. They're looking for a demonstration of the power of the Holy Spirit. They're looking for signs and wonders and miracles. We've removed the supernatural out of the church and all we're left with is superficial. But I believe it's time to make the supernatural great again in the body of Christ. It's time to make miracles and deliverance great again. It's time. Oh, come on. Help me preach. I didn't. I mean, I see a couple Hispanics out there. Y'all need to shout me down up in here. I didn't want maybe Washington Hispanics are different in California. We are wild. I mean, you cannot shut up a Hispanic in California. Praise the Lord. God says, I'm looking for people that would fully sell everything to buy the field. So here's what you do when you come to God. And again, I'm not trying to say you haven't come to God. I'm just trying to say this is what they did in the Bible. I'm just going back to scripture. We've gone so far from it that when we go back to it, we get offended. It's like, I'm offended. That's amazing. That's amazing. That's awesome. That's what happened when you preach the gospel. When you preach the gospel, people got offended. That is why thousands love Jesus. People tell me, like, are you mad that people leave your services? I was preaching last night about how we've lost the presence of God. We've lost the ark of God. We're casual with the anointing. And there were people getting up and leaving. They were leaving. They were getting their purse, getting their kids. And like, does that make you mad? No, it doesn't make me mad because when Jesus preached, people left. When Je- In fact, I get more mad when people don't leave because I'm like, maybe I'm getting soft. <laughs> like, I used to preach. One time I was preaching and at our revival service. I kid you not, at least every week I would offend somebody so bad they would leave. And usually it was a couple people and I used to call them out. My uncle, my pastor said, you can't call them out. When they leave, you can't say bye. And I used to literally be like, bye, I have a great conversation on the ride home. I would literally like make fun of them. My uncle's like, you can't do that. You're a pastor. It's rude. So I stopped doing that. And one day I was preaching and I'm like, Lord, nobody's left yet. Wow, this is amazing. Maybe I'm getting soft. And literally as I was preaching that, somebody, I mean, as I was thinking that, I was actually preaching a sermon on hell. So I was shocked that nobody left when I was talking about hell. And as I was thinking that, somebody got up and walked out. I was like, oh, praise the Lord. Maybe I'm not soft. My point is when the gospel, here's the thing. When the gospel was preached, and I don't have none of this on notes. I'm just flowing. Is this okay? Is this good? All right. When the gospel was preached in the Bible, it did not attract people. It actually drew people away because when Jesus called them, thousands would come. He would do miracles. He would feed them. He would uh, cast out demons. It would attract large crowds. But then when Jesus told them the price to actually follow him, the Bible says many of the crowds would leave him. Thousands would leave Jesus. And then Jesus would look at the 12 disciples and said, are you guys going to leave me too? In other words, this is what he was saying. Uh, Jesus 
probably and could have been tempted to change his message to cater to the crowds by Jesus looking at the disciples and saying, I'm not going to change the gospel to cater to the crowds. I'm not going to turn the blood of Jesus into Kool-Aid so it tastes better to the masses. Jesus was saying, I'm not changing my message regardless of whether you like me or whether you follow me or whether you go all in. The gospel is going to stay the same. It will still cost everything. You will still have to die to yourself. You will still have to step out and lay hands on the sick. You will still have to go out and drive out demons. It's not optional. It is mandatory. If you are my disciple, this is what you have to do. I'm offended. You're not allowed to be if you're a disciple. If you're not a disciple, you can be offended. Disciples are not allowed to get offended because if you get offended, you will walk away from the genuine Jesus and go find the counterfeit version. And there is a counterfeit version in America. In Galatians 1, it's another gospel. Paul even says in Corinthians, you put up with another gospel, you put up with another Jesus, and you put up with another spirit. Friend, I am telling you, there is a counterfeit Jesus. Many of us fall in the American church, and it's a Jesus that doesn't offend us. It's a Jesus that doesn't mind our worldly music, doesn't mind our worldly movies, doesn't mind us drinking, doesn't mind us partying, doesn't mind us cursing, doesn't mind us fornicating. If you are in fornication right now, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. And the girl looked at her boyfriend saying, I told you. Some of y'all need, if he can't wait for marriage, he's not a man of God. Period. People are like, I don't know if I should stay with him. Is he trying to get you to sleep with him? Yes, then you shouldn't stay with him. He's not a man of God. And you need to lay everything down. Here's what you do when you lay everything down. You lay everything down. I preached a sermon at a youth one time, and it was powerful. People were crying. I basically preached, we got to lay it all down. We got to surrender. And then the pastor got up after me, and I hate when pastors do this. They try to re-preach what I already preach. And he's like, yeah, you know, um, Isaiah didn't actually mean that. I was like, yes, I did. I'm right here. I did mean that. He's like, well, you know, I know a lot of you young people. I'm like, a lot of them are what? Getting touched by God? Why are we so afraid of the biblical gospel that says Die. Why are we so afraid of like, I'm telling you, we will see transformation in America when the church, instead of trying to gain everything, starts losing everything. We will see. Why is it the underground church in China has lost everything, but they have the power of the Holy Spirit and the American church has everything, but we don't have power. We got to lose it all. We got to lose it all. He got up there and said, Isaiah didn't mean give up everything. I meant what I said because I I preach what Jesus preached. See, when we don't have and do the biblical things we have to do to have Jesus in our life, we don't get the benefits of having Jesus in our life. We don't get the peace and we don't get the joy and we don't get the wholeness and we don't get the power and we don't get the vision and the destiny and the excitement and the passion and the zeal and the fire. Jeremiah said, I don't even want to preach this. I had another sermon planned. It was way nicer. He said, but when I'm trying to keep my mouth shut, this was Jeremiah, he said, there is a fire that is shut up in my bones that I can't contain. There is something in me. I'm trying not to be crazy. I'm trying not to share with all my family. See, this is what fire does. Fire makes you do things you wouldn't do before. Fire makes you step out of your comfort zone. When my sister saw me, I got saved and six months later or a couple months, I think it was four or five months later, my sister came home from college and my sister saw me. She started crying and she ran across the street to my aunt and uncle's house. And my uncle said, what's wrong, sunshine? And she said, where's my brother? That guy is not my brother. She didn't even talk to me. She looked at my face and I was so changed. She said, that is not my brother. What happened to Isaiah? This is what I'm talking about. When you die, you become a brand new person where your wife does not recognize you. Your husband does not recognize you. Your coworkers do not recognize you. Why do I have to tell everybody I'm a Christian? Why is it they don't see in my life that I'm so different that they immediately notice you must be some you must be a Christian you don't laugh at all the dirty jokes you don't talk like every but what but maybe we blended so in much into the culture that we have to advertise we're Christian rather than them recognize we're Christian because we're not doing what the biblical thing was Jesus said to be a disciple to be a Christian that means to be Christ on the earth a little Christ you're not Christ you're an ambassador and your representation and the Bible says you've been given the ministry of reconciliation and God himself speaks through you and calls people back to him you have been called as a representative 
representative. Come on, some of you need to put your shoulders back and say, I am not a grasshopper. I am not weak. I am not boring. I am not dead. I am a representative of the Most High God. I am an ambassador of Jesus. Everywhere I go, I represent Him. And I can't, I can't take time off. When I go, I'm going on vacation this week. I'm leaving tomorrow morning. I'm getting home at midnight, and I'm leaving at like 6, 7 a.m., driving a bunch of hours to go on vacation for a week. And when I go, I have to still be a Christian. I don't get to take time off. People are like, I'm going to take a sabbatical. What, a vacation from salvation? So do you know how many of us in summertime take the summertime off from God? Like, oh, I'm just going to not go to prayer. Not The world, the state of the world that we live in right now, maybe I'll share more in the second service about it. The state of the world that we live in cannot afford you taking vacations from salvation. We cannot afford you only being Christian on Sunday. We cannot afford you. Some of you are Christian until you go to work. Like, your coworkers are like, wow, you, you're actually a Christian? I didn't even know that. This is like the worst thing you could hear somebody say, like, I didn't even know you were a Christian. Why? Because there's been no witnessing. There's been no life change. There's been no passion. There's been no, and some of us, our kids, the only time they see us raise our hands is at the altar at church. And some, most of us don't even come to the altar. The only time they see us, and they're wondering like, dad, why are you at hands up at church, but I've never seen you with hands up in the living room. Why do you pray at church? But And our kids are watching this and they're creating a perverted idea of what God is and they think that God is somebody you visit on the weekends. And you know what the Lord is saying to the church right now? I'm not looking for weekend visits. I'm looking for full custody. I'm looking to adopt you with the spirit of adoption. I'm talking about 24-7 Monday through Sunday, every single waking moment. Isaiah are you saying everything? I'm saying everything. I am, I am talking about a holy obsession with God. I mean, it's not like it's just God. He's like, it's not a big deal, brother. It's just God. What do you mean just God? So Jeremiah, why have you forgotten me? He says, why don't you love me anymore? Why have you left me? I remember you, Jeremiah, when you used to go after me. He said, but now you're like, you just treat me casual. It's kind of like God's no big deal. I have everything else in my life. And like I preached about last night, you can see that video this week sometime on the YouTube channel at Isaiah Seldomer. Praise the Lord. Go subscribe. And make sure you buy Vlad's book, Build Fire, coming out in August. What is it, August 4th? I don't remember. Sometime in August? September. Oh, September. Okay. Even better. Just like I talked about when they pulled the cart, we pulled the presence of God around and we dragged God with us. And no longer as the church do we follow what God does. Now we make God follow us around. And we really have the nerve to, to, be, to apologize to people when we do what Jesus told us to do. People get all offended like, oh, you guys do deliverance? Oh yeah, you mean what Jesus did literally everywhere he went? I'm not apologizing for being passionate. I'm not apologizing for being radical. I'm not apologizing. Did blind Bartimaeus apologize? The disciples said, blind Bartimaeus, you need to calm down. And the Bible says the more they asked him to calm down, the louder he got. Why? Because I am desperate for an outpouring in America. I am desperate for how many of you want an outpouring of the Holy Spirit in your life? How many of you? Come on in the second. Maybe I should go to the second sanctuary. Are y'all loud over there? How many of you want fire and power in your life? How many of you want a fresh anointing today? Thank God we need you. We need you. We need you. We need you. So here, here, here we go. Jesus says this. Come to me. And some of us haven't done this. Some of us haven't done this. And surrender everything. That means your job. So here's what you do. When you come to God, you find the field with joy. You're not mad about it. If you're mad about it, you haven't found it. Let me say that again. If you're mad about surrender, you haven't found the treasure yet. And I, I can't make you get born again. I can't make you be a Christian. I know, I know we love to be like, just pray this prayer. I'm just saying, it's not in the Bible. It's fine to pray it. You can pray a sinner's prayer all day, all night. I'll pray it too. And pastors are like, if you want to get saved, I'm like, I'm just going to make sure, just in case, you know, I'll pray it, just a courtesy prayer. But I'm, I'm, I'm just not seeing that. In scripture, I'm seeing Jesus saying, if you want, you don't have to follow me. You don't have to be a Christian. You don't have to be a believer because if you are a believer, but you're a counterfeit one, you're actually doing more damage than you are good. And the Bible says branches that don't produce, God cuts off. Why would God cut off 
fake Christians from the body of Christ. It's because the dead branches make the tree look bad. The dead branches make the vine look bad. And God says, I don't want dead branches on my tree because my tree is a tree of life and a tree of love and a tree of power and a tree of fruit and a tree. And there's a lot of Christians that are genuine. There's a lot of you here today that are genuine. And there's a lot of you that are producing fruit. But then there are others that are not producing anything. And so I chop them off. I throw them into the fire because they are counterfeit. They're not really connected. They're not really mine. They're not real believers. And so here's what Jesus said. You must surrender everything. So when you surrender, surrender means, thank you, bro. Surrender means I give up. It means I lay something down. So for example, I got saved January 12th, 2011. I was a staunch atheist. I wanted nothing to do with God. I had no plan to serve him. That's why I'd be like, do you not care what people think about you? I was an atheist. You think I care? I didn't care what Christians thought about me. I didn't care what God thought about me. I didn't believe there was a God. And I came to an altar and I literally cursed at God. I had no other words to say. I said, God, I don't effing believe in you. I said, but if you're real and in my heart of hearts, I said, if you are real God and you show me you're real, I will lay everything down. I'll break up with my girlfriend in four years. I'll leave my job that I'm getting hired as a deputy sheriff. I, I graduated high school at 16. I graduated college at 19. I was going to become a deputy sheriff. I was going to start the academy in about eight months. I said, God, if you're real, uh, and I really meant this, I will give everything. I didn't know the Bible. I didn't know the Bible. I didn't know the Bible says to lay everything down. I didn't know that Jesus said, if you want to be my disciple, you must surrender all. But something in me, something in me said, you got to lay it all down. You got to put it all the chips on the table. And when God audibly spoke my name, and the moment I did that, the audible voice of God said, Isaiah, I don't want 99.9% of you. I want all of you. I want everything. Here's what surrender is. Surrender is saying, God, I'm putting everything in your hand. And God, whatever you want me to keep, I'll keep. But whatever you want to take, you can take. If you want me to keep my job, I'll keep my job. Because how many of you know we need godly police officers? If you want me to stay with my girlfriend and marry her, I will. Because how many of you know we need godly marriages? If you want me to keep doing that career, I'll do it. But the Lord said, Isaiah, thank you for giving it to me. I'm going to choose what you keep and choose what you what I take. So I put it all down. And I said, Lord, I'm giving you everything. And he said, I want your job in law enforcement. He said, I want that girlfriend. I don't, you're, she's not your wife. You're not going to be with her. And slowly but surely, in the next 24 hours, I literally started getting rid of everything in my life. I got rid of my video games. I got rid of every TV out of my house. I got rid of all my contacts on my phone. I got rid of every, everything. I deleted 40,000 songs off my iTunes. I deleted all these bootleg movies that I had. I got rid of all the alcohol, all the this that was hidden, all the pornography. I deleted, got rid of it, the cursing, everything, everything in my life. The Lord Lord begin to say, I'm jealous. I want this. All the distractions that I had. See, but here's what happens. We have that encounter where we find the treasure, but then slowly but surely we start picking up the things that God told us to put down years ago. This is why in 1 Samuel 5, when they brought the ark of God into the temple of Dagon, the Bible says when they put the presence of God in the midst of the false idol, that the false idol fell on its face and the people kept picking up what God was knocking down. And I'm telling you, stop picking up the things that God wants you to give up. There is only one way to following Jesus. It's a life of full surrender. It's a life where you say, God, my life is not my own. So I don't get to choose what I do. I don't get to choose my schedule. Every waking moment, guys, I want us to become so obsessed with God. I'm not talking about where you're in church 24 seven. I'm talking about where you're in the spirit 24 seven. I love pickleball. Like Vlad just said, I'm trying to get him to play, but he's rebuking me. He's like, I'm going to cast that pickleball demon out of you. I was like, that's the only demon I want. Do not cast it out of me. I like it. We're friends. Okay. And I go play pickleball and you know what? And I'm being truthful here. As I'm playing pickleball, I'm thinking about God. As I'm playing pickleball, I was just telling Jared, I was sharing with a guy who's never been to church in his life. He grew up as an atheist and he's like, I don't even know about church. I don't even know who Jesus is. He knows nothing. And I'm on the pickleball court, whooping him up at pickleball with my third shot drive and third shot drop. And I'm sharing with him the gospel in front of everybody. I don't care. I'm sharing. Yeah, you don't believe in God. And, and I told Jared, I got to talk to him again next time I see him. I'm going to keep working on him. Why? Because no matter what I do, I have fun. I enjoy all things on the Lord. I'll be on vacation. But as we're on vacation, if the Lord brings an opportunity, we're going to step out and share. We're going to talk about God. We're going to pray in the spirit hanging out with Jared. Jared is literally always praying in the spirit. It's, it's sometimes embarrassing because we're at the airport and he's like, Shimbo Roboko. And the flight attendant's like, what country is that from? I mean, he just never stops. Last night we were eating like at almost midnight at the little bar right there in the restaurant. And he was like talking real loud, sharing testimony. I'm like, bro, we got to be a little bit, you know, a little bit quieter. People are going to think we're what? Weird. 
People are going to think we're what? Different? People are going to think we're what? Where's, what are you guys talking about? When's the last time somebody came up to us and said, what are you talking about? Angels? Demons? Miracles? You know how receptive the world is to what you have, but we're, we're not sold on that what we have is worth giving everything for. And if you're not willing to give everything for it, why would the people you're trying to witness to give everything for it? People tell me, like, you're telling me that I have to give up. Think about this. We tell people, get saved and then just come to church on Sunday. And people are thinking, you're telling me I have to give up drinking and partying and drugs and raves and clubs because the world has a lot to offer. The Bible says sin is good for but a season, but there is the Bible says pleasure in sin. The devil has all of this to offer. And the world says, you want me to leave all of that to come for 90 minutes on a Sunday? Truth is, and most of our church services are boring. Most of the churches in America, there's no power of God. Somebody just looked like he's allowed to say that. (laughs) I don't care. We have church services all throughout the country where God doesn't show up, where we fabricate God, where we have to entertain you because the presence of God isn't there and we don't want no one to know. So we've replaced the presence with entertainment. Guys, we do not have a politics problem in America. We have a presence problem in America. The problem is not that we don't have somebody godly in the White House. The problem is we don't have godly men in God's house and the presence. People are like, we just need the presence of God in the White House. I'm like, how about we get it in the church first? Like, bro... I'm all for prayer in the school, but I want prayer in the church before I want prayer. Look at the, oh, help me preach Holy Ghost. Look at the Apostle Paul. Was there revival happening in the Roman Empire? No. Did it stop Paul? Did Paul say, once we get Rome on fire, once we get the radical, you know, once we get, uh, all, once, once we get Herod on fire for God, once we get Herod and all, we need to vote Herod in, and once we have revival in the Oval Office, and I want revival in the Oval Office, I want revival in the White House, I want revival at the playground, I want revival at Wendy's, I want revival at Taco Bell so the price is lower, I want revival at the gas station so the price is lower, I want revival everywhere, but the the point of the gospel was never to get revival in politics. It was to get revival in the house of God. It was to get, Paul said, even if revival isn't happening in the government, we're going to have revival in the house of God. We are not going to let the climate of America dictate the climate of the church. We are still going to pray. We are still going to fast. Who am I preaching to? We are still going to cry out to God. Regardless. Regardless, like we, regardless, doesn't matter if we don't have revival in the White House. And I, again, I want revival in the White House. Again, I love America. I love this country. But my goal and my aim is not to call politicians. It's to call intercessors. The future of America is not in the hands of a politician. A politician, I know we're waiting like, we got to end abortion. I want the ending of abortion. It's like something I pray for more than anything. I constantly preach about how I believe America is under judgment because of what's happening with abortion. But I understand that abortion is not a political issue. Abortion is a spiritual issue. And the only way we're going to see the ending of abortion is when the church goes to war against the powers and the principalities that be. When we begin to intercede like Daniel chapter 10 and say, Lord, we need your spirit. Lord, we need your presence. Lord, we need, come on, is anybody desperate? Saying, God, we need you in America. The only thing that will make America great again is the Holy Ghost. Genuine, I don't know if we have more of these, if we could get one, that'd be awesome. Genuine Christianity. Genuine Christianity is what we're missing in America. Gen, thank you, brother. Genuine fire is what we're missing in America. Genuine outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And genuine Christians say, I'm giving God everything. I'm giving God everything. I am so on fire. And for some of you, it might be a season of getting rid of your television. I'm being serious. Some of you, it might be a season of getting rid of your video games. I believe the Lord's about to deliver so many of you men that are in your 30s and 40s that act like you live in your mom's basement and you're still 16. Video games are great when you're 16. And video games are fine if you're doing it in moderation, but when your life is 10 hours a day on Call of Duty and no time in the prayer room, and then you say, well, I'm a Christian. Really? I mean, guys, we spend hours and hours on video games and television and TikTok. We scroll our life away. Well, meanwhile, the world is going to hell in a handbasket. And God is saying, who will lay everything down and say, Lord, you can take it all. I want every moment. I want a holy obsession with you. The night I got saved, 
I was sitting back like this in the very, very back where they roped it off and I thought God couldn't get me back there. I know some of you are in the second sanctuary outside peeking through thinking God can't get you back there. God can get you everywhere. And I sat back there like, well, the Lord's not gonna see me. And I remember the preacher saying, some of you are gonna get so lit on fire today that you're gonna, lo- you're gonna wake up in the morning and think about God and you're gonna go to bed at night and think about God. And I literally, I'm sitting back like this and I was like, this went through my mind when he said it. That's the stupidest thing I ever heard. That went through my mind. Like, that's so dumb. Who would ever be that way? That's so lame. How could God be that exciting? I, and you know what I thought about? I said, the last thing I think about before bed is drinking and porn and girls and lust and perversion and anger and depression, anxiety. And the first thing I think about when I wake up, literally when I was in the world, the first thing I thought about was girls and, and sex and drinking. All these terrible things that I hope all of you young people in here miss out on. People like, your kids are gonna miss out if you don't let them go to school and if you don't let them dress up and if you don't let them celebrate Halloween. If you don't, I'm like, yeah, that's the point. I want my girls to miss out. I want I want my kids to miss out on anxiety. I want my kids to miss out on depression. I want my kids to miss out on fear. I want my ki- kids to miss out on teen pregnancy. I literally want them to miss out. And I want to miss out on what everything the world has to offer. Everything. But here's, what I, here's why it didn't make sense to me that somebody would think about God when they wake up and when they went to bed is because I didn't have the treasure. See, when you don't have the treasure, you don't understand why people do the things that they do. Some of you don't understand why I'm saying the things I say and why I'm crazy the way I'm crazy. And truth is, I don't understand it either. All I know is I met a man, I found a thing that was worth giving everything for. But if you're not convinced it's worth giving everything for, you won't share it with anybody. Why would I share the news if the news isn't good to me? And if it didn't work for me, why would it work for them? This is why we don't pray deliverance. We don't pray deliverance because we don't get delivered and we don't believe it and we're in bondage ourselves. That's why people come to their pastor and say, could we do deliverance in the church? And the pastor's like, I would never do that. The reason why he's against it because he doesn't believe in it because he hasn't bought into it and probably because he has demons himself. So he wants to say, you don't need to do it because he hasn't bought into it. Pastors don't believe in miracles. They've never seen the sick healed. They never step out and pray for them. They don't believe in tongues. They've never prayed in tongues. They've never asked for it. So when you don't receive it, you will not believe it and you'll not extend it and share it with other people. The reason why, it's simple. We don't share the good news because it's not good. I know, I know you can share. Well, I just, it's not my personality. I know you can share because we still hear about your promotion you got eight months ago. Like, yeah, did you hear? Yeah, bro, we heard four times. Great. You got a raise? Praise the Lord. Pray for me. So, I mean, but you keep sharing about it. And the new car, we love the new car. It's awesome. It's amazing. I love it. I'm, I feel it. I, drive me in it. Gift it to me. Praise the Lord. It's awesome. <laughs> We've heard about it, though. We've, you've been talking about your 2022 car. I mean, it's 2024. Two years we've heard about your new car. I got new rims. Did you hear about it? Where's that same energy when it comes to God? Did you hear about the new game that came out? I'm level 94. It's like, where's that same energy with the things of God? We share when it's good news because it's good news. It's good news. But why isn't we shared the gospel? Because the gospel is not good news when you haven't fully surrendered to the gospel. When you haven't fully given everything. And the only way to be a true disciple is the road of laying everything down, surrendering everything. I told Jared this morning, I said, I'm going to preach on healing. I have a sermon about getting healed. Maybe I'll share next time, but I I don't think you're allowed to stay because we have a lot of people coming. But I said, I'm going to share. And then as I get up here, the Lord turned it and said, no, you're not going to share on healing. You're going to talk about laying everything down as a disciple and you are going to call them. And it's such a weird sermon. And I fight it even while I'm preaching. I'm fighting it because I'm going, Lord, I'm preaching to a church. I'm not like, I'm not at a park preaching to a bunch of unbelievers. I'm literally preaching to Christians about how they haven't laid everything down. But here's the epidemic. The epidemic is we're under self deception because we think we have we've convinced ourselves that's why when he looked at lukewarm church he said you say you're in need of nothing but i say you're miserable poor blind wretched and naked in other words your perception of your christianity is one way but my perception is another way and i'm not even talking about your christianity on sunday i'm saying throughout the week are we burning because fire it makes you obsessed you cannot put it out even if you want to it gets inside your bones and burns whether you like it or not fire changes everything do we have that fire do we have that holy addiction to his presence do we have that holy obsession some of you right now the lord said break up with that guy and you you haven't broken up with him and you 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 want the treasure but here's the only way you can get it and this i know again i i I know people are gonna make videos be like isaiah's preaching workspace you can say whatever you want to say okay call me whatever you want just don't call me late for dinner call me anything praise the lord You can say I'm preaching works all this. The guy, look at this, can't get the treasure until he first 
sells everything. See, we tell people, come to Jesus, accept him in your life, and let him work on you. That's not what Jesus taught. Amen. amen. One guy, I'm like, can I get at least, if I just had one amen, I'm good. I'm like, it's not heresy, as long as one guy says amen. So I thank you, brother. You, you literally saved me. I was like, maybe this is heresy. No. <laughs> I'm just giving the guys online free content, the YouTube guys that make videos about me. They're fresh out of content, summertime. I got to give them some free content here. <laughs> it's a joke, by the way. Spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down. The man first, I always thought it was like, come to God, accept Jesus, and then, you know, God will work it out, and it'll be fine, and you know, whatever. After like eight months, and we're all getting sanctified. I'm not where I want to be. I'm being sanctified. I'm being convicted every day. I'm finding sin every day in my life. I'm like, I didn't even know that was sin, but I'm getting rid of it. Every day, God's working on me. I'm at the altar last night. I was on my face at the altar. I was like, Lord, I'm, I need you. I need your presence. I, I respond to every altar call. I don't think I'm above reproach. I'm, I'm where you're at. I'm fighting the good fight. I'm fighting lukewarmness. I don't want to be casual. I want to go all in. I'm not preaching at you. I'm preaching with you. I totally get it. And I always thought it was like, come to Jesus, pray the sinner's prayer, invite him in your heart, believe, even though the demons believe. All you got to do is believe and just do whatever. It's fine. It's so easy. It's so this. And then you're good. And then I read scripture, Vlad, and I'm like, that's not anywhere. Jesus never did that. Jesus never said, just invite me in, brother, and just believe, and you're good to go. You can kind of just do whatever you want. You're totally fine. In fact, Jesus did the polar opposite of that. The rich young ruler comes says, I've obeyed every command. I'm a good person. This was not a guy that was like doing witchcraft and doing new age. This guy was a good, I obeyed every single command. And Jesus looked at him and said, sell everything you have and give it to the poor. And the Bible said he walked away sad because his possessions were many. Jesus did not say, follow me. And then as we're walking, I'll convict you to sell your properties and sell your stuff. Jesus did not say, follow me. And then whenever we need to build a building, you can sell your property and give me the finances to build the building. Jesus did not say, follow me. I'll put you on the board because you have a lot of businesses because sadly, most people that are on the board of a church don't know how to run a church. They know how to run a donut shop. He didn't say follow. That's, that's another sermon. You'll get that on the car ride home. He did not say follow me because you have a lot of money. Jesus said, before you follow me, you have to get rid of everything. If you don't get rid of everything first, you're not fit to be my disciple. Well, and then one disciple's like, I got to go. My dad died. Like, that's, come on, guys, that's serious. I like, I got a funeral to go to. Surely Jesus is going to be cool with that because Jesus is leaving town in like 30 minutes. And he's like, hey, do you want to come with me and be my disciple? And the guy's like, I'm totally down, Jesus. I love it. Like the great sermon, Isaiah. I mean, it's awesome. And I just, you know, I just got to finish the campaign on the new game. And uh, right when I finish, then I'll do it. I'm down. I'm ready. I just have this job. It's really demanding, Vlad. And in a couple months, I'll be able to come to worship and prayer and service and do all. It's just, I got to have, I just give me a little bit more time to keep living how I want to live. But I still want to follow you, but I still, and so I just, let me go bury my dad. And Jesus looks at the man and says, let the dead bury the dead. If you cannot follow me right now in this moment, 10, 29, 57 seconds AM, if you cannot say yes to me right now and say, God, I'm laying everything down before you. I want this holy obsession. He, this is what he said. You're not worthy to be my disciple. You're not worthy to follow me. He says, birds have nests and foxes have holes, but the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. Jesus was not saying I'm poor. Jesus was not poor. There was a bunch of businesswomen that financially partnered, amen, and supported his ministry. That is what your Bible says. Well, then why did Jesus say I have nowhere to lay my head? He wasn't talking about natural. He was saying I'm not comfortable in this world because I'm not from this world. And in the same way, I'm not comfortable. I have nowhere to rest my head and be comfortable as my disciples, you should not be comfortable in this world. If you are my disciple, you have to surrender everything. Let's all stand to our feet. And if anybody knows how to play this, I don't know what this is called. Keyboard, you can get up and play. <laughs>